Step outside. All right, a very good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. I would like to acknowledge traditional caretakers and ancestors for these lands we reside on in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the 19 Pueblos, and wherever you're beaming in from, we'd like to acknowledge your traditional caretakers and ancestors of these lands. Uh, so we're very grateful that we can all be here this evening. Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. And we are very, very excited to acknowledge Native American Heritage Month uh, and uh, the presenters here this month, uh, which you can read more about at our website. Uh, we are honoring Native Heritage Month. We've been posting two Indigenous presenters on our Facebook page daily. And we will continue to do this for November. And they have all blessed us with their Indigenous wisdom and medicine through our virtual events in these uh, hard times. So thank you. And if you've noticed anything different about our background, ta-da, I'll be telling you more about this beautiful background uh, in that commercial break where after Frank talks, I'll tell you all about how you'll be able to have this blanket potentially. Okay, so I'd like to get e this evening started with our very special, special, special guest of honor, Frank. And uh, his last name is really, really interesting. Etowagashik, I said it wrong. Etowagashik. Yes. Etowagashik, okay, I was close. There is way too much to say about Frank. There's no way I could do it in this hour even to talk about all of the wonderful uh, movements and uh, uh, in, empowering uh, events that uh, Frank has been involved with for our people. He's a Michigan native from the Little Traverse Band, uh, Bay Band of the Odawa tribe. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking and let Frank take over. And we're going to enjoy Frank for about 35, 40 minutes. And then we will, as usual, invite all of you to join us after our commercial break. Thank you. Welcome, Frank. Woo all right. Thank you. Ani, Pipigua Ododem, Waganak Singa Donjaba, Nakwe Gizik, and I said, hello. Uh, I'm the Sparrowhawk is the mark of my family. And I am from the land of the Crooked Tree, which is in Northern Michigan here. And I am, uh, my name is Noonday, uh, otherwise known as Frank Etowagishik. Uh, I've spent, uh, someone once asked me what my goal in life was and I thought about it for a while. And eventually I came to understand what it is. It's to be a good human being. And part of being a good human being is to become a good ancestor. So you work through your life to do those things. In this process, I've worked as, a, as an artist. I do traditional woodland Indian pottery. Uh, I'm, I have been very unsuccessful in learning how to say no. So I've been very active in lots of different boards and, and other activities uh, at the local level, at the tribal level, at the state level, at the national level and international level, where I've worked on, on all sorts of issues that are of importance to Indian country, uh, intellectual property, climate change, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and uh, water accords throughout the state, working on international issues, cross boundary and the Great Lakes. All of these are different things that I've, that I've had a chance to work on. But they all come down to, and, I, and I've been very privileged to do that. I, I also served, and I would be remiss to not mention this, but I'm a recovering politician. I was uh, the chairman of my tribe for 14 years and the vice chair for a couple of years before that. I spent a number of years where I was not in office at the tribe. And recently I was appointed as one of the three appellate justices to the tribe's Supreme Court. So it's over the last 20 years, I've been very involved in tribal government and, but also involved in the cultural and spiritual side of our tribe, attending ceremonies and, and, and doing different things. Uh, 
I'm a student, a student of our language, although I, I don't speak fluently, I know a lot of words that I'm learning and as an adult, adult learner that is difficult. Uh, I was one of the many whose parents did not teach them the language. And so as adults, now we're, we're struggling to relearn that. When we have our ceremonies, considering that this is Veterans Day here in the United States, when we have our ceremonies, we're always, uh, we're honoring the veterans. When we go to a powwow, there'll be a, a veterans dance to honor the, honor the veterans. And we have, uh, we, we, we think about this a lot and there'll be a lot of the, to honor those veterans who have served and given their lives and also to honor those who are in harm's way on this, uh, on any given day. And, and to, you know, we pray for them. But I, I had an experience this last summer that was of great importance to me. And that is I had just said some prayers and honoring the, the, the veterans. And I started feeling quite, um, so let's just say I was getting messages from the spirits who weren't angry, but were quite forceful about the fact when they said, what about us? And I realized that we also need to, when we do this, we need to be remembering all of those warriors who through countless centuries from time immemorial have fought to protect our peoples, to protect our way of life, to bring us to where we are today. And that we need to think of them when we're honoring those veterans. We need to think of them at that in that same way. So I learned from that experience and I had to apologize to those ancestors for not saying those things that should be said and for not remembering them in, in, our, in my prayers as I, as I said them. And so I, I did a pipe and I put some tobacco down in the sacred fire and, and, I, uh, and I promised that I would make sure that whenever I was honoring veterans, I would always remember all those from who from before those times, from those ancestors to who helped bring us to where we are today. So I thought those were appropriate words to be thinking about on Veterans Day today, that that was such an important part of our culture. I think about what that means to, to fight to protect our people. And that is, uh, you know, there's people who have fought many different kinds of battles there clearly are the combat veterans and the folks that fought those wars. But we have also to remember all of those who have fought to protect our people amongst for other types of threats, the whole threats from drug abuse and, and alcohol, those, those threats that from all the different things that happened to us through colonization and how we need to be strengthening our communities, be doing things to encourage that the, 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 the reawakening and understanding and, and passing on of those traditional values that we have. So when we think about those people who did that and those ancestors, for instance, I think about those ancestors, those warriors who were negotiating and fighting for those treaties. Some people would look at those and I've heard people say, well, those people who signed the treaties, you know, they really didn't have our best interest at heart. They signed away our rights and all these other things. And we think about it that actually they were negotiating in a very tough time. And I look at them and I honor them because they protected things for us. And as an example, those rights that we fight for today in our courts and all the other places that we're, that we're, we're doing this, those rights uh, today, the courts are looking at those and, and you know, in, in US v. Michigan in a fishing rights case, you know, we have access to 50% of the fish in the lake, for instance, uh, and, and the courts have looked at all these as property rights. But I maintain that there's a whole other way to think about this, those rights that those warriors, those ancestors helped to protect. Because when they looked out and they were getting ready to sign those treaties, they, they reserved the right to fish. And of course, under the canons of construction, uh, treaties were to be, are to be interpreted the way the Indians would have understood at the time they signed, not the way some attorneys might parse those words today. And so those, those uh, today the courts have interpreted that as a property right. Well, while that's true, and I don't wanna dispute the fact that those things are there, 
our worldview was not that because when our ancestors were, were preserving those rights in the treaties, they didn't look at those waters, like the waters that are behind me here over Lake Michigan. They didn't look out there and say, those are our fish. They didn't do that. What they did is they reserved the right to fish. And when they did that, they reserved the right to sing for the fish, to dance for the fish, to pray for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, but to live with the fish, to honor the fish and to respect the fish. The fish provide sustenance, but we also respect them and it's right back and forth. We take care of each other. And so that whole thing with fish, it's a relationship right that right to fish that they, our ancestors reserved in those treaties. And so that's the way our understanding would be that it is that relationship right. So, but that, you think about it, I just talked about fish, but what about air? What about water? What about all of the rest of the natural world? What about the night sky? That view of the night sky is precious to us. It's a resource. It's something that's valuable to us. There's a relationship we have with that night sky. There's a relationship to that natural world. I maintain that all of those are wrapped up in those treaty rights. And since the federal government has said that they have, that they have become the trustee, now in the three cases that Justin Marshall did, the Marshall Trilogy in the 1830s. Uh, they, there's this doctrine of dependent domestic sovereignty that they talk about tribes being having that. We got to realize that that's the United States and their view of us, that we are dependent domestic sovereigns. As a tribal leader, I can tell you, I did not feel dependent or domestic. I did feel sovereign. And I got to understand that our people, we maintain that we're sovereign. That's our understanding. Now we're negotiating the acceptance of that sovereignty with the United States. And part of that has happened through the interpretation of the Supreme Court and other cases all the way up to the recent McGirt case that just happened in Oklahoma. These are important things for us, but that is not who we are necessarily because we are that sovereign and have that inherent sovereignty, inherent rights of those relationships with the natural world and those relationships with each other. All the indigenous people all over the earth have relationships with each other. And we relate them in, in the same way. Our ceremonies may differ slightly in name. They may differ in exactly the way we do it or how we dress, but they are honoring the same thing. They're honoring those relationships. So I think about that and think about how important that is. When I'm thinking about veterans on Veterans Day, I'm thinking about how that, what it is that they fought for, what it is that they did for us and what that means to us today. Now we're also taught to think about the consequences of our actions through a time period long enough to encompass seven generations. And I like to think about that as not just that it's seven generations out, you can count them while we're in the third or the fourth or whatever. But the way I think of it is, is that if you're driving down the road at night and your headlights are going ahead of you, every hundred yards you go down the road, your headlights go another hundred yards down the road. And that seven generations is a time period in front of us. It's a buffer in front of us that we're to think of. We're to think of what does it mean? What are, what are the actions that we take going to do to help bring that about, to help bring things to happen in those seven generations. And what do we do that's going to help them and leave good things for those coming generations? But we also, each and every one of us here listening to this, each one of us is someone's seventh generation. What were those ancestors doing seven generations ago? What did they leave for us? Where did they move? What did they teach their, their children? You know, what did they teach those grandparents all the way down through the line that came? Looks like 
looks like we got a freeze here, Frank. Let's give it a second. I'm waiting to, for this to unfreeze there. It looks like it's unfrozen now. Can you hear me again? Yes, yes, thank okay. you. Very good. What did those ancestors do that brought us to this, to this meeting right now? What did they do to bring us right to this place? Because whatever they did got everybody here tonight. And what are we doing that's gonna get people in the future? So when we think about those, those things, we're talking about balance. We're talking about balance in time. And that's an important thing to think about. You know, it's important to think about us being having this spot in our life. Everything we're doing is, is part of that seven generations from before and part of that seven generations that is coming after us. But we don't get to that seventh generation after us. If we don't get, if we don't treat this generation well and we don't get into the next generation. So it's really important for us to think about how we tell our stories, how we tell these things, how we express those, those concerns of our cultures. You know, we talk about the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual, and as those, you know, four direction teachings, we talk about you know, earth, fire, wind, and water also in those four directions. And we think about the idea that we need to be balanced. I once heard a story from someone that really helped demonstrate this to me. And they said that the goal in our lives should be to be standing in the middle of the world. Standing in the middle of the world to me means that we're balancing all of those four direction teachings coming together to be standing in the middle. We're not too far down any one of those directions. Off, we're not dealing too much with the mental at the express at the at the the uh, at the uh, at the uh, we 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 don't want to be down this road where we're all consumed by by mental activity and not being involved in the in the physical. We don't want to be doing this where we're uh, we're praying all the time, but we're not we're not uh, you know we're not working out at all and, and taking the health of our bodies. We need to be thinking about what it means to be balanced, and to achieve that harmony or that balance is really important for us as we work through these things. I thought about this a lot while there were we were talking a lot about water protectors, and we were talking about the whole issues of how do we how do we honor one of these elements, these four elements that we have, earth, fire, wind, and water? How do we honor the water and protect the water? And we had water protectors, we're doing that. But at the same time, we had water protectors. We need fire protectors. We need earth protectors. We need air protectors. We need to have people who will realize that we have to do, it's a, it's a, you can't do one at the expense of the others. They all are tied together and we have to be balanced in the way we do this. And then we will be successful. Now I've taken this idea of balance and thinking between these, these directions. And I've taken that actually to apply it to, for instance, a tribal budget. Now that may seem like a stretch, but you apply it to a tribal budget and you see where you're spending your money as a tribe. And are you spending your money in a balanced way in the community? And if your community is out of balance, often people will take and spend more money in the way that it appears to be out of balance because they really think it needs more attention. But sometimes it's out of balance because you're, you're, you're not spending enough money in other areas. So you need to analyze how you're spending your money. And so there is a, you can think of this analyzing a, your personal budget or a family budget or whatever. You can do these things to try to figure out how that's going to uh, how that's going to tie in to looking at such mundane things as a budget compared to our traditional teachings. How do you mesh those things together? We have to be able to figure out how to do that because we have different worldviews, but there is a place where they can connect. And those difference in worldviews, uh, I think of Vine Deloria's The Metaphysics of Modern Existence or uh, Gregory Cahady's Native Science. These are books, really good books about that difference in worldview and how that affects our decisions. Uh, those, I recommend both of those as great books. They helped me a lot. 
I'm currently reading Braiding Sweetgrass. I can't believe I waited this long to read that, but also talking about that difference in worldview, that view between science and others. I was, I had to write a, an introduction for, uh, for something that's coming out as a report, but uh, uh, for the, the triennial assessment of progress for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement through the International Joint Commission, which was founded by the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. That's between Canada and the US. It's a big, long thing. But in the end, I was asked to write an indigenous introduction. And I'm going to read just two paragraphs that I had written about that. One is understanding the natural world as relatives and not as property is fundamental to our indigenous way of being. We are but one of the members of a vast natural world family. We do not own the earth or the beings who live within, upon, or above it. We respect our relatives and strive to do them no harm. In return, they help provide us sustenance, shelter, and healing. And the end is that the, this, this report's a measure of, of accomplishment, not only in the science of water, but also in achieving balance in our lives and the lives of all our relatives. It's that kind of view where you're taking something that is a that's a it's a document that's a it's a uh, from a what can be very dry and long meetings, tedious meetings, trying to add soul to it and put give a perspective to it, where you you can see that we're touching not only the the minds of the people who read it but we're touching their hearts and their souls as well and we're encouraged them to have physical interaction with with the waters these are the kind of things that we can do when we take those those wonderful teachings that our ancestors have passed down in so many different ways with so many different tribes all over the country and around the world these teachings can be they hold within them the salvation of mankind because fundamental to all of them is respect and lack of respect for the natural world is what's gotten us into the mess that we're in. Lack of respect is what's gotten us to this place where, uh, you know, we can't drink the water from that stream because, well, you know, it's polluted. So we go to the next stream. Well, when all the streams get polluted, what do we do? And we have the same kind of thing. We're dealing with, we have one world that's got it. We have a changing climate. What are we doing to work on that? So I've had the occasion to speak at various different things in my life. I, I, get a, I had the honor of being selected to give the closing remarks for the indigenous caucus at the Paris climate, uh, climate uh, talks. And so at the closing plenary session, I gave the last speech that night, the closing speech. and. The polite, that's a polite way of saying that indigenous people got to speak last. Everybody else got to speak before we did. But nevertheless, being last, you remembered. And I think that it was a good thing for us to be, to be in that position. Uh, I gave a speech which I, I delivered on behalf of the caucus. I didn't write it, uh, but it's, uh, I did add some touches to it myself. But we got uh, two minutes. I took three, by the way, but we had two, <laughs> and it was the at the that was the kind of remarks that we were able to give about what we felt about the the Paris Accord, and now we're we're it's still in the news today because our president elect has now talked about how important that is to us. About it's a really important to think about these kind of things, those climate those issues of climate, for climate means to us getting back to the fish. In Lake Michigan, it's about one and a half degrees in temperature from where it will no longer be the natural habitat of the whitefish. It's a, it's a primary fish that we catch here in the Great Lakes. It's a wonderful eating fish. And it's, it's used to be in such abundance that it was just, it was, it was the, the, a, a major food source for us. And it's also what our commercial fishermen catch and sell. But Lake Michigan is getting very close to no longer being able to naturally have whitefish. And so to us, this is critical. 
These are the kind of things that we have because these are our relatives and we don't want to do things that cause them harm and cause them to no longer be able to live where they need to live. And so I think about all those, uh, all of this stuff and how I wanted to mention the, I did mention briefly the International Joint Commission uh, and that uh, we've been working for years to get a more indigenous voice there. Uh, and at, for the first time in history, uh, Henry Lickers, who is, uh, who is uh, Nish, he's Haudenosaunee, he was appointed as one of the six commissioners to the International Joint Commission. He's currently serving. And this is the first time there's been an indigenous citizen of a tribe who's been a member, who's been one of the commissioners. There also are a number of people who are on the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Uh, there's uh, four of us who are serve on that capacity there, you know, indigenous. The indigenous voices are, are really getting stronger and they're being accepted. Uh, we're being asked for our opinions more. And we believe that those traditional teachings that we have that guide us will help us to ensure that those people coming seven generations from us now, that those people will have fish to eat. They'll have water to, to be in. They'll have a world to live in. And we're working, that's our goal, to be able to do those things. One of the things that I learned, some people say, well, that may be impossible to do those. But I learned a few things in my life uh, in the politics that are, you know, working. I jokingly tell people I wore three pairs of shoes out walking in the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C., doing, trying to educate otherwise uneducated uh, or well-educated people, but uneducated on the points of Indian law, where we talk about what that relationship is between tribes and the United States. And this was one of the things I've done pretty much my whole life, had to train people to this extent. And that is the Article 1, Section 8, the third clause is the Commerce Clause. And it says Congress shall have the power to, and then there's the third clause, that's to regulate commerce amongst the several states with the foreign nations and with the Indian tribes. And that's the acknowledgement in the US Constitution of the pre-existent sovereignty of tribal governments. And we're the only, there's only three sovereigns mentioned and we're one of them and that's that acknowledgement. And then, and the, what's, the, what's the supremacy clause? It's article six. Uh, that goes that says that this constitution and all laws made pursuant to this constitution and all treaties made or which shall be made, no matter what any state to constitution or law, they can't pass a law that disagrees with this, that those treaties are the supreme law of the land along with the constitution. So what that means is, is that, and, and it also says no judge can ignore that. So those are the fundamental parts of the federal relationship, tribal relationship. And that helps us. It helps us, it helps our attorneys that work with us. It helps the leaders who have to do these, this work with people. It helps us to promote that inherent sovereignty. But we always have to remember who we are. We have to remember how it is that we came to be here, that it was those ancestors, those warriors and the leaders those grandmothers and all of those people together who put, who lived their lives in harmony and lived their lives in good ways and faced tremendous challenges and were able to overcome them so that we're here today. And we have to remember those things. So once again, I'm, I wanted to, uh, one of those things I wanted to, to mention is that the that once again being on Veterans Day, it would be it's just so uh, um, we have to remember all those people who came before. I am so happy to be able to be here to speak. I'm getting uh, fairly close to the end of my time here to speak. I know we're going to have time for questions. I'd really like to be able to engage uh, questions from folks and things of that sort. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, uh, I wanted to tell a story yet before I end about what, things that we have done at, say, the 
at the international level and the power of our culture, the power of our collective culture, not just from one tribe or one Frank, it looks like we froze up and just FYI, we got 10. Okay, uh, let's see here. I'm waiting until, uh, until, can you hear me yet? I see the interpreter going uh, as soon as, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we're good, we are back in. I was gonna tell you this story that happened during the negotiation uh, at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we were in, in Bonn, Germany, we were negotiating for the implementing of the, the, the facilitative working group that was gonna implement and still is to the implement the, in, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform from the Paris Accord. And we had oh, probably 150 indigenous people at this meeting. Uh, and we had representatives of all the different countries and they, they negotiate by groups. So there isn't, there may be eight countries in one group, but I'll have one country or two that are in the room negotiating and the rest are in other rooms negotiating other issues. So in the room, we probably had about, oh, maybe a hundred people sitting around a great big square table. And we had negotiated for hours. And then we negotiated for hours more the next day. And it was getting late in the evening uh, on, on the last day we had before we had to make a decision to be done. This was on, a, on, a, on a, I think it was a Thursday night. Uh, and we had to be done before Friday. And we were negotiating and the tension in the room was really high. And three countries were out in the hall um, verbally engaged aggressively with each other over some really sticking points that we that we that might have actually ended the whole negotiations had ended the negotiations on two occasions before this and they were in the hall doing this and we were all sitting in the room and um, without any plan whatsoever at all one of the one of the sami relatives uh, the, the indigenous people of i think you think this fellow was from finland uh, stood up and sang a song. And then uh, a Pasquayaki woman who from the US got up and sang a song. I sang a song from the Great Lakes. And a woman from Malaysia got her iPad out and put it up by the microphone, held it up there and had music and she did a traditional dance. And as we did this and passed this singing around the room for all the indigenous people, the tension in the room fell and relaxed and the room really just relaxed. And after we were all done, in walked the folks from the hall said that they'd solved the problem and we were done. Well, they might've thought they did it. We think we did it by singing those songs and relying on our traditions and relying on touching the spirit and the heart of the folks, not only in the room, but our singing could be heard outside the room where these guys were working. And so we think that that's, that's an example of how our traditions can be brought to bear in an international arena that will be helpful to, to, to work on things. And so there's, uh, uh, I see I'm, I'm even closer now to the end of my time, I'm watching over here. And I'd like to sing the song that I sang at that, at that meeting. Uh, and this is a water song. It's a song that was, uh, that's been given to everybody, men, women, children, everybody to sing by the person who made this song. And the, and it, the, the words are water, water, we love you. We thank you and we respect you. And I'm gonna sing that song now. Nibe Gija Gago Gimme Gwetch Awain Nimi Go Gija Wain Nimi Go Nibe 
ki jage go ki me gwacho wen ni me go ki ja wen ni me go ni be ki jage go ki me gwacho wen ni me go ki ja wen ni me go ni be ki ja ge go ki me gwacho wen ni me go ki ja wen ni me go oh me gwach i thank you for this yep. opportunity Joni, Joni, yeah, thank you very much. That was very beautiful, Frank. Thank you for your time this evening. And I'd like to just uh, take this time to let you all know that we've been blessed with our elder, our brother from the Michigan lands. And we are going to uh, acknowledge your ancestors, the little Traverse Bay Band of the Odawas. Uh, pretty impressive tribe of a uh, group of us native people up there in Michigan. So thank you. And uh, we're really excited about uh, next week. We have a sister coming in and her name is Renee Romanos. She is Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes from Oklahoma. So please uh, tune in next week, same time for Renee. And uh, uh, right above me, Indigenous Ways, Dot org has all that information. Just Google it and have fun with that pretty user friendly website. And uh, we would love uh, for you to share this recorded video with everyone, which will be available in the next 48 hours on our website. There you will also find over 60 indigenous presenters and artists. And uh, you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter go to our indigenousways.org website and click on sign up for newsletter and then you'll have all the happenings that we have going on. And down below we have all our social media sites. You're welcome to subscribe to them. All these events have ASL interpreters and are free. And we're very grateful for our ASL interpreters. We'd like to take this time to thank our sponsors who uh, moved very quickly with us when our festivals got con uh, canceled and agreed to uh, support this uh, platform for our Indigenous people worldwide. National Endowment of the Arts, Westaff, Westaff Cares, New Mexico Arts, New Mexico Humanities Council, and National Endowment of Humanities. And as always, we are very grateful for our Indigenous Ways board members and individual donors. We have been surprised. Somebody out there, an anonymous person, nominated us for the New Mexico Magazine's um, Heroes, New Mexico Heroes. So we were able to uh, have a publication uh, for the month of November. You can go to our Facebook, Indigenous Ways 501c3. There's a link there for the article about the work of Indigenous Ways. So our next concert series that we're having, we're very excited about. November 21st, we are going to honor Bill Miller and Friends. We're uh, celebrating Native American Heritage Month. So this is a fundraising concert for Bill Miller. And we're gonna speak to him for all his work and all the years and the songs and the roads and trails that he's done for our indigenous people to allow windows into our worlds through his amazing songwriting. We have our beautiful sister, Narissa Bond, who's based in Long Beach, Virginia. We have our brother, Wade Fernandez, who comes from Wisconsin. He's the Menominee. And we also have our beautiful, uh, Shelly and Phobe, uh, beautiful uh, Shelly Morning Song uh, from uh, and Fabian Fontanelli. They're based in the Zuni Pueblo. 
and they're all amazing musicians. We're also going to have a song or two from Indigi Femme, and we will have our ASL interpreters as well. This is Saturday, November 21st at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And to go on to the next uh, topic, where our Black Mesa Mountain uh, relief runs, we want to thank everyone who has contributed and participated to our five Black Mountain relief runs. We went this past Friday to Black Mountain and it was absolutely successful, beautiful, amazing. Our elders on the mountain all got a box with uh, needs for the winter time and we were able to deliver more 55 gallon water barrels with uh, spigots at the bottom so the water comes out hand washing stations. And uh, we're uh, going to continue doing that. We're going to stay connected with the chapter house up there. So our Black Mountain Water Project raffle, I mentioned this beautiful background we have. Our beautiful sister, Julie Kaufman, who lives here in Santa Fe, hand stitched this blanket. Look at it here. It's uh, two sided. And uh, we are going to be giving this away. And this is going to fund our uh, sustainable water project on Black Mountain. There's, it's uh, threefold. One is getting the water barrels up there with the hand washing stations, getting to the chapter house, filling those barrels, getting our uncles on the mountain to deliver them. The second is to set up water catchments, more than the 55 gallon, but more like 1,000 to 2,000 water catchment containers. And the third one is also to get some drilling on that mountain, which is about 1500 feet above the surrounding lands on the nation. Black Mountain is way up there. So uh, this is a long-term project we're involved with and that's what the raffle of this blanket is gonna go towards. If you wanna purchase these tickets, they're $10 each or $50 for six. You can check this out at indigenousways.org. Very easy, go to donate, click on that, and there's a link for this raffle. Uh, please support it, it's on the homepage as well. So we wanna make it as easy, as easy as possible for people to access this raffle and get as many as they want. So we will be doing the drawing, whether we sell 15 or whether we sell 1000 tickets, we're having the raffle on Wednesday, December 2nd. 2020 at this time during this commercial break. Thank you all for that. And of course, Julie Kaufman, thank you for that as well. You can also donate to our PayPal. You can put uh, donate to our Indigenous Ways website. You can send us a good old snail mail as well if you'd like. Uh, all of those will be accepted. And uh, we'd like to uh, go ahead and bring everybody on, whoever wants to show their faces and say hi and acknowledge uh, our beautiful uh, brother, Elder Frank. Come on in, everybody. And if you're on social media, you're welcome to post a comment, which I will share with Frank. Uh, does anybody want to come on? OK. Hello, Donna. Hey, Antonio. Judy. Richard. Christina Bueno. All right, Donna, would you like to get started? Oh, there we go. got it. <laughs> New technology here. Um, so Frank, that you're very impressive. Uh, you've been around the world. Um, telling everybody what they really need to hear. I, I was delighted to hear all your words. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think the important thing is not only with me being able to tell people things, but being able to listen and hear all of the different things that happen all the other places around the world and to hear what, the, what other cultures have to say. I was impressed we had a, a signing ceremony for, the, the, for a, a treaty here the United League of Indigenous Nations Treaty. We did a first signing at the Lummi Nation with 11 nations. And then later on, we had another bunch signed up at, uh, at, in Denver at the National Congress of American Indians. And the people who did the ceremony were Aborigines from Australia. They came to do our opening ceremony. 
wow. and and they uh, they actually when they dance they use uh, boomerangs. They hold one up one way and one the other way, and they clack them back and forth to make the rhythm to dance with. And uh, I tell people, and this is not much of an exaggeration, that you could really see the the difference in generations because the 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 elder was dressed in about half a yard of cloth and about a gallon of paint. And progressively there was more cloth and less paint until he got down to the grandson who had a, a, band, a red bandana on and a t-shirt and jeans, you know. <laughs> and, but they danced to the four directions. And they, wow. danced, they, they did the same kind of ceremony that we would have done, but they were doing it. In the, and it was really, it's the idea of listening to people and seeing what they do and understanding those things, those common things that we have, it's just so important. So I'm, I'm glad that you appreciated the comments. Thank you very much, uh, Donna, for your comment. And real quickly, we got a Shelley Morning Song and Fabian Fontanelli, uh, amazing musicians out of Zuni Pueblo, said that absolutely wonderful with three hearts and a, uh, the sign in the you know, that emoticon. So Antonio, would you like to share some words tonight? Yeah, um, when you were talking about the, uh, uh, the fishing rights and the water rights up in Michigan, it brought me back to a long time ago when I s attempted to go to college for the first time. It didn't do too well, but it was during that time up in Seattle, uh, during the boat decision of, of fishing rights. And that all the passion that, that happened up at University of Washington and all around, uh, and people that were so fervently, uh, you know, for uh, the fishing rights, uh, and and it was interesting. My memory serves me uh, because my brother was writing. Uh, he was a journalist during that time, and he was writing how he thought it was amazing how many uh, non-native people joined native people during that time to that, uh, yes, then they needed to keep their inherent rights for fishing because it was not only the cultural part, but they, uh, I, this saying, what, you said it almost, he says, the fish is not for us to eat. The fish is not for us to see. The fish is who we are. We are the fish and the fish are us. And I'll, I'll never forget how that was said during during a gathering. And it was just wonderful. And you made me remember that. Uh, and that was a, when I started looking toward uh, Indian law and, and stuff when I went back to school later on. Yeah. So thank you for helping me remember that. Well, thank you. You know, one of my one of my heroes, and I got later to consider him a, a good friend at the end of his life, was Billy Frank, who fought so mm -hmm. hard. Or the the fishing rights there in the northwest and yeah. you know i what i liked about billy uh first of all uh, every time you saw him and he saw you it was like he'd never seen you before but boy he was just so glad to see you and he'd curse a blue streak while he was saying all these smiling things and you know and, and it, <laughs> just this amazing things that, that he did i just loved that man and what he was able to do and and the work that he did in helping to bring about some of those 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 cases that were from the Northwest, uh, uh, I, I was really impressed with that. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, that, uh, that your, the statements about the fish there, because that, that is exactly what I was saying. And, it, and you can yep. see those thoughts are, are not just from the Great Lakes, but they're from people all over. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much, Antonio and Frank, for your comments. And uh, would Judy Shapiro like to share? So, <laughs> when did I, Frank, when did I meet you? Like almost 20 something years ago? Yeah. Yeah. At NCAI in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, that's right. <laughs> uh, finding out that we had worked with the same people, one of whom I liked and he didn't, or the other way. Yeah. Yeah, the other way. Um, I don't like to miss an opportunity to listen to Frank, and this is just another one of those good opportunities. Um, the water song that Frank sang, I've been trying to teach him the one in Hebrew for how many years? Well, several years now. 
we, we do cross cultural stuff, and it's a great pleasure. Um, we're both both of us right now taking a break from a conference that we're both attending, but not not at. Um, so we're sort of mid think about many things, and this is this is a nice break from that kind of thinking. This is this is um, this is breathing. This is good. And thank you, Frank. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Judy and Frank, and uh, definitely would like to hear from Richard. Well, I came in again five minutes late, but everything I heard was wonderful. I'm from Ohio, mm -hmm. Shawnee and the Miami people. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, a Kiowa friend of mine recommended the uh, Native Science book to me. Mm -hmm. Now, I always knew that Native people knew, oh, shit, no more than us white people. I, I just always knew that. We may have known it at one time, but somewhere along the line, we forgot. So that's why I've always thought it was very important for people, not just white people, but everybody, to listen to the indigenous people of the world, all around the world. And I'm fortunate enough to live here in San Francisco, and I live on a lonely land. And they're struggling here too. They're trying to get their 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 land. Um, of course, they're not going to get it all back, but have a presence. And uh, I just want to say to you, thank you, thank you for sharing what you know. It's extremely important. And I think uh, the things that have happened here in the recent years have made some white people and some people from other other areas to finally come to a realization that indigenous people have something to say because we have not been listening. It's like Thomas Binyaka for years, the Hopi, went around all around the world, telling people, warning them, letting them know, telling them of the prophecies and their ears were shut. Now, some are beginning to realize I hope it's not too late, that yes, they're right. So thank you again. I, I love coming to this. Um, I just love it. And, and I wanna thank uh, uh, Tosh and uh, I'm having a brain fart right now. <laughs> but I wanna thank Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Femme for Elena. doing everything, everything, Elena, thank you, I'm sorry. I, I wanna thank them as well for doing this. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. I, I appreciate that. All right. And uh, Christina Bueno, thank you very much, Richard and Frank. Christina Bueno, look, would you like to share? You know, I kind of missed half the program. I did come in late. I did catch the conversation where we were talking about the whitefish and I got a little distracted, I'll admit. Uh, but you were mentioning the white fish and the relationship between the fish, Mother Earth and humans, and, and that relationship. And um, I, I just caught that piece of wisdom, but I very much enjoyed being reminded of that. And I do support uh, the environment. I do support fishing rights and environmental rights because of course without the fish we don't have anything we are the fish and with the fish we have survival and so that's how that relationship is defined yeah and as you uh, uh what because i not only talked about fish but also about how the fish is just part of the picture but also that that whole relationship with fish is also a relationship with the trees, with the medicine plants, with the earth, with all of the creatures that we share this wonderful creation with. It's that it it's that that relationship is is very broad, and now all of these are relatives, and it's that that relationship of how we help take care of them and they take care of us. We have gifts for each other. There's things that we have, and that. That's really the essence of that. So thank you for your comments. 
Yes, thank you, Frank. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for adding that little piece for me. And I'm also very grateful that Indigenous Ways has interpreters. Every time I come, the interpreters are here and I have access to what is being shared and I really enjoy the moment. So I'd like to thank you for the interpreters, Tosh and Elena as well. Both of you, thank you. Yes, yeah, much love. Thank you so much, Christina and Frank. And uh, before I, uh, there's two more people I'd like to acknowledge. Caleb, would you like to say anything this evening? This is Caleb, not tonight. Okay, thanks, Caleb, for being here. We sure appreciate you. And uh, uh, my sister, Michelle Redman, would you like to say something this evening, Missy? Sure, sure, why not? Hi, uh, thank you, Frank, for your presentation. It was fascinating. And thank you for representing us in all these, these big events that are affecting the world, our climate, the, the way people consider, you know, our generations, the seven generations. And I'm Navajo from the Navajo Nation. And um, we very much believe that the, the earth and the animals and the people, everything around us is our family and that we are caretakers of each other that we all take care of each other and we have that respect that you talked about. And that's very important, you know, and it's very important to think about that the community and everything is having a relationship to everything, but also, um, you know, thinking about how we are gonna work with one another and making a plan and then putting that plan into action. So with a lot of the things that you were talking about, it really made me feel like as native people, for those of us that are activists in this world, that we are, you know, getting our voices heard finally, that people are starting to take seriously our traditional ways and teachings. And uh, what, you know, what, what a huge turnaround from in history, you know, from, you know, from the oppression and assimilation and, you know, trying to ex almost extermination and, and then to be able to survive and, and, and just be able to rejuvenate ourselves in everything that we have and maintain what we have so that we can carry it forward, the wisdom of our ancestors, which we carry with us because it's a very important part of our tradition. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I really, I really enjoyed all of it. It just, it just filled my heart. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those those wonderful comments. Thank you. Thank you, Missy, and thank you, Frank. I wanted to acknowledge our sister, Angelina Owillo. I believe she's in uh, Seattle. Angelina, we love you. Thank you for being with us tonight on Facebook. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Memorial Day, our veterans uh, in the spirit world, our veterans that are still living that have been to uh, serve in our military and also to pr protect our homelands and definitely to our current military members that are out there protecting our homelands. So thank you all very much. We love you and uh, happy Memorial Day, everybody, and honoring every veteran. Thank them. Thank them for their uh, selfless service to this country, this beautiful country. I'd like to definitely give a Round of applause always to our beautiful ASL interpreters, Zoel and Chris. You two have really been uh, very, very consistent and persistent. And uh, thank you. Thank you being, for being committed to uh, Indigenous Ways' virtual events and concert series. And we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, next week again. So we're very grateful for that. We want to thank all of you for your time. We want to thank all of you that have Zoomed in. We want to thank everybody on social media. And we also uh, want to let you all know that uh, we are being recorded. And uh, you can check this out in 48 hours. Thank you all very much. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of the evening. And uh, let's give it up for Frank Etawa Gishik. Yeah. Thank you. Tell your wife we said thank you, too, for being a part of the Call to Voices for Native Women. That was a fun project, and she was the second speaker. 
Yeah, uh, she really appreciated uh, the opportunity to do that and was really excited to see the final product come out. Yes, and our, our beautiful little sister, Zoll, was on that too, and uh, so was Missy. And mm -hmm. uh, so thank you all, everybody. See you on Wednesday. We'll see you next Wednesday. Stay safe out there. And Frank, I need to give you a call right after this. Thank you, okay. thank you everybody. Yeah. Much love. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wet your hands, feel my face Touch the earth, touch the earth, touch the earth the